Great. Hi. It's well, been it's too so long. Good. It's been far too long. It's so good to see you again, man. You look fantastic. So do you. Thank you very Elegant, much. Elegant, So, um, what's changed, William? I mean, what I'm interested to know what your, what your daily creative regime is like these days, and has it changed much, or...? Well, um, it's been like one long day for a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The longest day. Um, you know, um, I've been touring for 15 years before last year, and I was going to do this massive world tour, the biggest one ever. And then, of course, like everyone else, that all got canceled on yeah. March 12th a year ago. So yeah. whatever. So, you know, I've just been here enjoying my wonderful little California, little, little mid-century modern home I managed to buy wow. through the grace of God and with my crazy work. And it's got a swimming pool and so nice, man. Fruit trees and flowers Aww. all around. You said by the you said by the grace of God. Do you yeah. believe in the grace of God? Oh yeah. I do. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I know so, you do. There's, there's, there's a, there is a certain grace that is sort of when you're gifted things in your life and you kind of know there's no possible way you could really have thought that up or made that happen yourself. All right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of little rewarding of faith. So um, I was just looking, at, I took some very brief notes, uh, William, for uh, our conversation. Really brief, I'm just going to read you, read you them what they are because they're so... Um, lamentations, atomic time outside time, time travel, glam, mind-body division. <laughs> <laughs> what was the last one? Mind body division. You know, the just dualistic idea that the mind and the body are somehow separate or you know are two separate things, two separate um oh, mind body, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll roll back. So lamentate. Let's talk about lamentations. Um okay. I love that record. What one of the things about about all your recordings in general though is you can't just you can't just drop a William Bazinski recording. You know, you, you, you have to be ready for it because it, 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 it takes over the room. And not only yeah. that, it, it, it takes over the flow of time or how you experience time. And I thought with Lamentations particularly, because the tracks are kind of shorter, it made me think about how the loop, the loop is almost like a sort of taking a sort of atomic slice of time outside of time. Then it sort of infinitely repeats. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah, they're little bubbles, different different universes, you know, and they could each be repeated indefinitely. But uh, with this one, you know, it's a series of vignettes, really. Right. And have you had, I mean, because I've had uncanny experiences listening to your music many, many times. That's what I mean about that feeling of being out of time. And I always wonder how it is for you because it's a haunting music and it's a haunted music, but it must be all the more personal for you because you've lived with these sounds, seen them evolve, seen them disintegrate. And I'm like, what, what is your experience of it? Have you, do you have this uncanny sense of time travel or timelessness or something fucking with time when you're listening to your own music? Or creating it? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Uh, you know how it is when you're when you're deep into something. You know, you gotta get away from it sometimes, and yeah. you work on something for a year or whatever, and then you put it out. And you know, this record is a it's a moment in time. It's in a way. It's kind of more like uh, melancholia because of the short pieces mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and uh, unlike some of my other records, this one isn't one that I would. 
I mean, I played it constantly when I was working on it and deciding, et cetera. But it's not one that I would listen to every day, at least right now. Why? Why? Because you've lived with it too long or? Uh, it's. I'm working on other things. <laughs> yeah, I totally understand. Well, so do you not tend to revisit your earlier music? I guess that's what I mean, because it seems like it might take an emotional toll in a way. That one does. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Um, I mean, I love the way it turned out, especially the the final operatic stuff at the end when we got to that with manipulating the tape on that one particular loop and getting those amazing things happening. Yeah. Then we knew, okay, well, this is now we have a record, so yeah. That's it. Yeah. But the pieces, all the pieces, like, talking about that piece in particular as well, the pieces for me always have an uncanny sort of organic life to them. Like they're almost these little uh, life forms that are evolving and, and growing in real time. Yeah, that's how they do. It's crazy. Well, it's like entities, isn't it? So it's like a sort of possession. It, or actually, you're like the magician, sort of like bringing out, conjuring these entities from this sort of, an, from this sort of entropy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels like that. And I guess that's what I mean in terms of time travel and that, that it seems to capture a very specific moment. I've been interested in that a, a lot, especially like in a, in a book I've been writing, my new book, Monument Maker. Again, I have this idea of a loop, of how a loop somehow can preserve something in time. So um, one of the things that happens in the book is they're all after this they're trying to find this loop, this looped piece of film. And it's a looped piece of film of two people making love. And it lasts for maybe 20 seconds. You know, it's a woman on the bed and the man is at the top of her. You can't see the man's face. And she moves her leg round the man's arm and round the man's leg in a certain shape that seems symbolic. And then it repeats again and again and again. And certain people start to wonder if they are the man in that clip. You know, uh -huh. if somehow they have been preserved as a lover forever. Uh-huh. And, I, and I, after I, I wasn't directly thinking of, of, of your music, with a, of your of your loop music as well, but it occurred to me, it's, it, it's kind of that same thing. It's almost like it allows something for the, with disintegration loop when the tapes are disintegrating, but you somehow allowed them to live forever in this same little moment. Yeah, certain pieces, yeah, it, it can do that, yeah. So, it's like a form well, of- I'm dying to read your new books. You've been so prolific, David, my God. And Extra Bath was just so magical and, and sexy. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, I mean, I'm picturing your beautiful Heather when I read about Extra Bath, you know. Yeah. Um, I picture Heather. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's understandable. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is sexy and it's so weird, William, because... You know, I think there's a sort of uncomfortableness with talking about a book as being sexy or even including, I mean, people seem so uncomfortable with sex and sexual content, but for me, it's absolutely vital. It's like that Blakeian thing, like the sexual imagination is primary. The sexual imagination comes first, but even people who are not imaginative particularly can have no problem imagining sex or fantasizing about sex. It's almost like the first entry point into the glories of the imagination is sexual. Yeah, it's true, yeah. You know? And I was thinking even of that, again, I'm thinking of the when you were on the, the cover of the Wire magazine, looking so good <laughs> and so hot, and people were uncomfortable. They couldn't handle it. Yeah. I love the way uh, the editor uh, put it in that Sour Grapes note from that guy, and um, and then the blowback next month was funny. Was, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, come on. I like clothes. I haven't I did too. worn anything except, you know, pajamas and my, <laughs> my cashmere sweater and a pair of black jeans for a whole year. And, you know, when they come to take a picture, you want to give them something to work with and <laughs> la, la, la. So, you know, I had my stylist friend come over and we shopped in the closet and pulled out a few things. And 
gave them some options, whatever. You know, I didn't get to choose the pictures. I didn't know they were going to have me half naked on the cover and stuff. But what are you going to do? Well, as if you didn't know, how were they going to resist? <laughs> <laughs> but it's so weird because I've always felt that the same. I mean, it's so weird that experimental music or underground music as a sort of kind of anti-glam thing, because that's how I always felt like I love the music, but I don't really look like I love the music, you know? And I always, I was always into rock stars. The people that inspired me were people like, you know, Iggy, uh, David Sylvian, you know, people like that. People were bringing the glam. I wanted examples. Ben, Bowie, you know. You know Bowie. <laughs> yeah. You know, to me, it comes hand in hand. You know, you reinvent your, your mental space. You reinvent how you hear things. You reinvent how you walk down the street or how much attention, you know? It's show business. You got to get something. I mean, you know. But I've always been eccentric and like glamour and clothes and this and that. So what are you going to do, you know? Yeah. But it was all, for me, music was always about reinventing yourself, you know? Yeah. And if you ain't going to do that in terms of how you look, then what is the point? But that's always mean, I think, when I took that note about mind, body, division, there's almost like there's a hierarchy now where like cerebral things or thought things or things that cannot be seen or touched are higher than bodily things, than how you look, than how you feel. And that's just such, such, such a weird dissociation that people still have. That there is, that the flesh is completely distinct to the spirit. Yeah. But it doesn't make any sense to me in a way, you know, how, how there can be any kind of hierarchy. I mean, William Bozinski is how you look and how you sound. You know? Yeah. But um, I'm liking your rings. What's going on oh, with the rings and the bracelets? What are the bracelets? Aren't they beautiful? They're absolutely stunning. Navajo. Really? And what is the stone in the center? Turquoise. Beautiful. Turquoise. Silver amazing if you look at the design of these two things. Yeah. It's like a black hole. Wow. You think of it in 3D. Yeah, I hear you. You've got yeah. this vorte vortex going out this way and this way, and then it swirls around that way. That's, that's how they look. Wow. You know what it is? Yeah, it's so great because what it kind of captures is like the sort of moment of creation. Right. You know, this in and this outgoing. I love it. Yeah. Where did you get your love of jewelry from? Because I love um, it. Oh, I've always loved sparkles. <laughs> was there any early, did you have early influences? Because for me, a lot of the men in my life, like my, my dad's uh, my, my, my dad's family, my dad's brothers, um, they were the first man I ever saw who like, wore chains and, 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 and wore rings. And, and it kind of blew me away because I'd never seen a man do that. And it, and it looked so glamorous that I was like, I'm committed to rings and jewelry for life after this point, you know? Exactly. Yeah. No, I don't know. I, Jamie and I uh, love turquoise Native American jewelry, and he's a collector of everything. So for a while there, his parents had a condo in Santa Fe. They're, they're from Dallas, and uh, they would go up and go to Santa Fe and uh, <clears throat> New Mexico. And there's a really great dealer up there called the Rainbow Man who has a very fine shop full of really beautiful trade jewelry and um, <clears throat> blankets and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we like that kind of thing. And Jamie has bought a collection over the years. So, But I always wear these. This is what I always wear. I love it. So um, do you have any style rules or style no-goes? Any what? Like style rules, like things that you won't allow, things that you do allow. Like, for instance, off the top of my head, like I, when I'm wearing leather boots, I like old leather boots worn in and they got to be brown or tan. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like, I, I don't wear like dark shoes or boots. I just don't think it, it works. Well, for your style, I can see why. Yeah. Um, no, I don't know. I, I like what I like. You don't have, so talking about your early influences, who were your early style icons in? What's that? Talking about your early influences and stuff, who were the early style icons? That kind of turns oh, you on. Bowie, of course. You know. Was that the major yeah. one? Was that the first one? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to be him, you know. <laughs> well, do you remember the first time you heard, or more importantly, saw Bowie? 
I think the first time I saw a picture of him it was in black and white, small picture in maybe like some kind of cream magazine, maybe or something. It was pretty. I was pretty young. It was, uh, and he looked so scary. And I thought, is that Eddie Munster grown up? What the <laughs> hell is that? You know. And then, of course, when I got to high school, and you know, Ziggy and all that started coming out. Forget about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We were just all into glam, you know, in high school. The boys were wearing platform shoes and high-waisted bell bottoms, skin tight, and you know, and tied, up, tied up shirts and wow. You know. That's how they were dressed when they go to school. Well, I had to <clears throat> I had part-time jobs. I had to buy my own uh shoes because you know. You'd go to the mall and there was uh, Tom McCann, which was like little brown buckle pilgrim shoes. And that's where my mother would take me. And across the aisle was the wild pair with all these fabulous three colored Spanish platform boots, you know, $21. And it's like, wow. You know, so... Once I started making my own money, I would go and get my own shoes. And my mother would be like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I would go to the hairdressers and take the latest Bowie incarnation picture. The girls would be like, oh, pineapple shag. Hell yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, I kind of miss those days in a way because when, when the tribes were on the streets, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You well, know, I think the tribes are kind of on the internet now, and that's fine. But I remember being in an odd small town and seeing someone dressed all glam. It seems so heroic and incredible. Oh, yeah. You had to be brave. Yeah. Yeah. That was the whole thing about my first book. Like, it's not easy being Iggy Pop and Airdrie. It was hard to be like David Bowie or Iggy Pop in a small town, man, you know? God, yeah. I had to get out of Texas pretty early. I, I was too pretty and you know <laughs> these boys would pull up neck jocks pull up next to me in the car and try to hit on me and then they'd realize I was a dude and then <laughs> you know that can go bad real fast <laughs> they'll kick your ass yeah. but uh no I learned how to run pretty fast when I was a kid <laughs> um do you ever miss Texas because, I mean, I love Texas. I know it's a complicated place, but I have a huge love affair with it. I've spent so much of my life there, and it's part of yeah. my heart in so many ways. Certain things, but it's such a fucked up mess right now because they, the gerrymandering and all the creeps and awful jerks they've elected across the board. And I mean, it's a mess. It's a mess. I'm so upset about it. It's just too much. But I no. always thought... I always I thought, Houston, sorry. No, go ahead. I always thought that Houston, it took me a long while to get to know Houston because it's a hard place to get to know. I think when you first start, it seems as if it's all just suburbs, strip malls and freeways. But yeah. when you get deeper, I always thought, you know, Austin, you know, keep Austin weird. Houston yeah. is the weirder town. It's just oh, hard definitely. to get there, you know? Definitely. Now, Houston's really... Really interesting. Dallas is just a complete bore. And, um, but Houston's very cool. Uh, you know, I was born in the Montrose area, which of course now is the gay area and it's the yeah. museum district and everything. Yeah. Uh, I was there with Jamie a few years ago, our, one of our old friends and a huge early supporter of Jamie's Bill Arning was the director of the, uh, Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, down there, right near where all the other museums are. Yeah. And they had, they did a video show <clears throat> of our work and had me do a performance there a few years ago. And so it's it's a beautiful area. All those ancient live oak trees lining the streets, just yeah. so beautifully, and um, you know, it was humid and shady and i don't know there's just it's it's a deep swamp you know that that houston yeah, thing 
<laughs> well, I mean, one of the things that, that, that helped make sense of it to me was hearing DJ Screw. I mean, that 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 is is the sound of cruising along those streets with the live oaks and the sweat and heat, and you feel like you're driving almost in slow motion, you know, yeah. and then you've got this, like, total cough syrup. Yeah, you know? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. It's swampy. Yeah, it is. The bayous and the, you know. Yeah. I was looking, you know, three years ago, we were having to move out of our rental house we'd been in for 14 years, and I was looking all over the place. I even looked at some mid-century modern little houses in Houston because, you know, I couldn't really, didn't think I could afford LA. Yeah. It's so damn expensive here. And, uh, but then the flood happened and I was like, fuck that. I'm not going to Houston. Forget it. You know? Yeah. I and know. then I managed to find this place. Wow. Just what I've always wanted. And in one month we closed and I got it, you know, so. Amazing. You want to see the backyard? I'd, lo I'd love to. Give me the tour. Yeah, let me see that. I want to see the swimming pool for real. So this is my office. That's your office? Uh, wow. The lights are on. The living room's in there. The lights aren't on. But Great. here's... Wow. Oh, wow. What a beautiful pool. There's Dr. Beyond. Hey, what's up? Wow. Look at that cactus. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh my God, it's a little slice of heaven, Billy. Yeah. Those stairs, I love those stairs, the concrete stairs on the, on the left there. Yeah, the pool, you can dive into the deep end from those. It's quite deep. Wait, is that deep, really? Yeah, it's 10 feet deep. Wow, amazing. Yeah. It's it's too cold to to swim yet. So is it? It's probably as warm as a Scottish summer right now, <laughs> Billy. <laughs> How have you been? Just staying home for a year, you and yeah. Heather. Yeah, Heather and I have just been, we stayed home for basically the entire year, and it's been really nice because, like you, you know, we're focusing on home. We have a nice pad, and we really like it a lot, and we work on it a lot, and. We've sort of developed like sort of routines and rituals. Like I'm actually working less than I used to, which I quite like because I used to work day and night. But now we have we have the nights off, and we have a routine where we we roll into the kitchen, we open a drink, we get a record on, all play a vinyl record all the way through both sides. I start cooking, and we have the whole hangout. So no work in the evenings, you know. Great. What are you making? Oh God. Um. Who cooks? I cook. I cook every night. I mean, I'm I'm totally into cooking. It's one of my favorite things. Oh, wonderful! What did you make today? Have you had dinner yet? I haven't made it yet. What are you well, gonna make? Um. Well, la the jury's out, but I'm thinking of actually doing some uh, maybe uh, old school haddock and chips. Actually, oh, breading yummy. some haddock, getting it in the oven, a little bit of chips. I just I, I was pickling a lot of beetroot over the winter. So I've got some amazing jars of this specialty pickled beetroot. So I'm maybe going to crack that out tonight as well. And Yummy. I've just been doing shit like that, you know, like baking bread and pickling vegetables. and Fabulous. And also, like, collecting boots. I've been got really big in it, like, buying, like, uh, original 60s, 70s uh, Cuban heel boots from Ed uh, online. So I'm no getting, quite, yeah, getting quite a collection. I don't know if I can show you this, but this is my latest, which is, you see it? Oh, I, nice. I love that. Original 1960s little uh, Cuban heel Chelsea boot. So I kind of buy them in sort of rough condition and kind of get them restored. So That's great. I love Chelsea boots. So do I, especially with the Cuban heel. You can't beat it. And when you yeah. look at the styles right now, the modern ones, they're so ugly. They're so ugly. You know? And I so know. you have to go vintage to get that kind of shit. And it's funny, oh, Heather yeah. Lee uh, had a sort of a, a theory because I really hate uh, training shoes. I really hate oh. sneakers. I'll, I'll never wear sneakers in my life. It's not one of my actual cardinal rules. And Heather noticed, she said, don't you think that sneakers or like modern trainers look like modern cars? You know, like big bulky American cars, kind of like with no shape or curve or sexiness. 
baby shoes. They all look like baby <laughs> they shoes. Are. They are. Ugh. They are. And, you know, people complain about how it's harder to walk in, like, a Cuban heel or stuff like that, but you're like, isn't it worth making some kind of sacrifice for style? You get used to it, for How's God's it? sake. You know? Yeah, anyway, that's another one of my cardinal rules. And I was thinking about um, that red pair of boots you had on in that wire photo shoot. The Gucci. Yeah, I had to have those. Is that Gucci? Gucci, yeah. Yeah, man, they look absolutely amazing. You ever wear them out? Oh, yeah. Do? On tour. You do? On tour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, those are... Those are, you know, show show gear. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I haven't been anywhere. So I just wear my, I'm wearing my Hermes sandals right now that are all worn out. I've had them for about 15 years. Yeah. So do you miss, you miss hanging out and getting a little bit wild and partying or are you enjoying oh, yeah. all this day or? Yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm a recluse anyway. So, but, but yeah, I, I miss, like, I like to entertain, you know. I used to have big parties and everyone always came to my house because we had the big place. And, no. um, you know, I wanted to have a big party last summer. There's so many wonderful musicians and artists out here in LA now that I know and have met mm -hmm. through years of traveling. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I have this house with gardens all around and a pool and I wanted to have a big party for Sparkle Division launch last wow. summer. Of course, that couldn't happen so maybe this year hopefully we can have a party mm -hmm. yeah i miss that too heather and i are pretty social and again i like cooking and we would always have like big dinner parties for loads of people hanging out and yeah i miss yeah. that stuff so much man yeah i know it's terrible well but you know what we're going to appreciate it all the more you know even yeah. just being able to catch up with you tonight was such an absolute delight and I just appreciate all my friends and all the amazing talented people I know around the world keeping it real and looking glamorous and gorgeous. Yeah, you guys always blow me away. <laughs> I have such fond visual memories of our time together. Um, when, you know, that was like the first festival I was ever invited to. Is that right? Um, yeah. And what was that install? What year was that? I think it was 2003 or something. And it was like Charlemagne Palestine, Zev, yeah. um, me. Um, who's the Japanese guitar player with the long Keiji, hair? Uh, Keiji Haino. Keiji Haino. It was Tony Conrad and Keiji Haino, wasn't it? Keiji, yeah. And then, you know, at the last minute, David Keenan got Jandek, and I was supposed to be the the one, but of course everybody <laughs> was all over Jandek or Yandek, however you pronounce his name. But anyway, um, no, we had so much fun. It was an awesome time and visiting your house and walking around and yeah, it was beautiful. I love those it. were amazing times. I mean, those festivals, genuinely, those lineups, they're unrepeatable, absolutely incredible times. Amazing lineup and getting to hear Charlemagne banging away in that yeah. giant venue that that under under the train station place. Do they will that will that happen again? Uh, that venue is actually shut down because they found loads of men having sex behind a huge curtain one night at a club. What? <laughs> yeah, it got busted. It got busted because they were having this big, massive orgy basically backstage at a club in one of the one of the nights. <laughs> God, <laughs> it was a legendary venue. Really, really amazing. Really weird, and, and, you know. Perfect. Yeah, I, I mean, it's sad that it's gone, but it it kind of was the perfect ending in a way, you know. <laughs> well, William. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, William, it's been great to speak to you. I mean, that was, it was so good to catch up. And, and I we... know. I can't wait to see you guys in person again. That'll happen next few years. It's got to, I'm sure it will. Okay, well, you right. take care of yourselves. Yeah. Heather Don't... sends her love as well and lots of love, Billy, and stay in touch. Okay, big kiss to you both. Love right, heaven. Bro. I love you. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.